Welcome to the Sagan Lecture, which will be given by uh, Guido Imbens in a bit. Um, the Sagan Lecture has a, a long history at the uh, Royal Economic Society. And since 2019, it uh, is sponsored and published by the Econometrics Journal under a new remit, which reads that it commemorates the fundamental contributions to and profound influence on econometrics by John Dennis Sagan. And that it does so by promoting econometric theory and methods with substantive, direct or potential value in applications and their actual empirical application, which nicely coincides with the editorial aims of the Econometrics Journal. Now, the inaugural lecture under this new remit was delivered by Jim Heckman in 2019 and will be published uh, in the May issue of the, of the Econometrics Journal, together with the uh, proceedings of a special session on uh, the panel data that we organized at the same conference. There was no lecture last year, unfortunately, uh, but we're very much looking forward to the second lecture in this series, which will be given by Guido. But before that, I first would like to give the floor to co-editor Michael Jensen, who will award and celebrate the 2018 and 2019 Dennis Sagan Econometrics Prizes. Thank you, Jaap. Um, greetings from uh, California. So I'm here to um, award and celebrate the winners of the Sagan Econometrics Prize um, from 2018 and 2019. Uh, as you may know, uh, the Sagan Prize was introduced in 2011 by the Econometrics Journal on behalf of the Royal Economic Air Society. It's awarded for the best unsolicited article published in our journal, the Econometrics Journal, uh, in any given year. And it, uh, the one criterion we have is that uh, the winners of the prize have to be within five years uh, of being awarded their doctorate. This year, we are awarding not one, but two prizes uh, because of the uh, pandemic. So we're handing out both the 2018 prize and the 2019 uh, prize. The 2018 prize goes to uh, Matt Goldman uh, and David Kaplan. David is here today. And they're getting the prize for their article, Non-Parametric Inference on Conditional Quantile Differences and Inner Quantile Ranges Using L Statistics. That article was published in um, the June 2018 uh, issue of our journal. The 2019 prize um, is awarded to Arturas Joris um, for uh, joint work with uh, Joachim uh, Westerland. Um, the title of that article is Optimal Panel Unit Root Testing with uh, Covariates. It's given uh, only to Arturas because he was the only author who satisfies the criterion of being within five years of receiving uh, the doctorate. So this was not meant as a disrespect to Joachim. Um, and th this article was published in the January 2019 issue uh, of uh, the journal. I'll say in the interest of time, I'll just say a couple of things about uh, each paper individually, uh, but for completeness, let me say that among other things, um, these prize, uh, both of the prize winning uh, articles, although they are very different uh, in detail, what they have in common is that they very nicely represent what it is we're trying to achieve uh, with the journal, which uh, in, in Jobs' words is to publish econometrics uh, that matters. So if you actually pick up uh, these articles uh, and read through them, as I would encourage you to do, you will. I hope you'll agree with me that this is uh, exactly uh, the type of uh, econometrics that meets the Goldilocks criterion of having both uh, something for the pure theorists in the audience, but also uh, for consumers of econometric theory uh, uh, as well. So in more detail, the 2018 prize, again, goes to David Kaplan and, and Matt Goldman uh, for their article, Non-Parametric Inference on Conditional Quantile Differences and Inner Quantile Ranges Using L Statistics. In a nutshell, what that paper does is it proposes a way of constructing confidence intervals for things such as interquantile ranges, where um, what is interesting uh, and useful about th those uh, confidence intervals is that they are very accurate in a sense that it can be made precise um, uh, in a way that would satisfy uh, an econometric uh, theorist. Uh, so they have that very interesting theoretical property, uh, which also translates uh, into things that practitioners uh, will care about, uh, namely um, the intervals are as short as can be, subject to covering uh, uh, what you're interested in uh, with a certain prescribed, uh, pre-specified level of uh, significance. Um, and uh, on top of that, um, it is also, uh, as it turns out, the method is very easy uh, to implement. So it basically ticks uh, all the boxes that we would want for any article uh, in the journal. In this case, it was also happened to be authored by, by people who were within five years of getting uh, the doctorate, so it was an easy call. Uh, we, we gave the prize in 2018 to uh, Matt Goldman and uh, David Kaplan, um, where David uh, is here um, uh, today um, uh, to uh, accept the prize. For 2019, um, in many ways, uh, the article uh, is similar uh, in, in a big picture sense to the 2018 winner. Uh, the 2019 winner is optimal panel uterine testing with uh, covariates. Uh, what is at least theoretically interesting uh, about that paper is that it points out uh, what you might call a complementarity uh, between uh, 
a panel uh, set up uh, and the existence of covariates that uh, arises in connection with uh, unit root uh, testing. So here, it, it's been known for a while how to make good use uh, of panel data if you have it when you're doing unit root testing. It's also been known how to make good use of covariates if you have them when you do unit root testing. Uh, but it turns out that the cumulative effect of having both is in a certain sense bigger than the sum uh, of its pri uh, of its parts. Uh, uh, sorry. So this super additivity, uh, uh, if you will, uh, is uh, something that had gone unnoticed uh, prior to this uh, article. So that's obviously of theoretical interest. And thankfully, it also translates directly uh, into um, properties uh, that will appeal uh, to uh, uh, practitioners. And the article goes out of its way to explain exactly how to uh, extract uh, these efficiency gains that have been left uh, on the table uh, in the earlier uh, literature. So as I mentioned earlier, this is co this is joint work between Aturas uh, and uh, Joachim uh, Westerland, um, but uh, only Aturas is within five years of getting his uh, doctorate, so he will re be receiving uh, the prize uh, on his own. So congratulations, uh, uh, Aturas. Um, so finally, uh, before handing it Back uh, to uh, uh, Yap, I'd say that my understanding is that unfortunately we don't have time for uh, acceptance speeches or even an on-stage appearance because there is no stage. Uh, um, but uh, at least I thought we could uh, give a big uh, virtual round of applause to uh, uh, the winners while we're waiting uh, for Yap to introduce uh, the Sagan lecture here in Minsk. Yeah, thanks a lot, Michael. And uh, of course, I uh, I add my congratulations to uh, to both the the winning set of authors. Uh, I've been so fortunate that I uh, could actually hand out a certificate to uh, to Arturas uh, last week because uh, he happens to live in Amsterdam, just like me. And so, uh, even though we don't work uh, in the same place, I uh, I did manage to meet him, uh, even though it's uh, Corona times. So, congratulations. Um, on to the uh, Sagan lecture. Uh, I'm obviously very excited that uh, Guido Imbens has agreed to deliver it this year. Uh, as you may know, Guido is the uh, Applied Econometrics Professor and Professor of Economics at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. He's also currently serving the, uh, the profession as the editor of Econometrica, uh, which is much appreciated. Um, I guess Guido needs a uh, little introduction. I guess neither econometricians nor empirical economists will need an introduction to, uh, to his work. Uh, his early and seminal work on non-parametric IV estimation of heterogeneous treatment effects, and in particular of uh, local average treatment effects, has had a major impact on both econometrics and empirical economics, and is routinely taught and applied uh, by all of us, I guess. Uh, Guido has followed up uh, over the course of the years with many influential contributions to causal inference and econometrics of treatment effects and also other things. And in recent years, he has shed some brilliant light on important current topics like inference on treatment effects on subjects interacting over networks and the use of machine learning to analyze treatment effect heterogeneity. Um, now, in the interest of time, I will, I will just stop there and say that it's a great honor to welcome Guido, who's brought so much to econometrics and empirical economics to deliver his Sagan lecture on causal panel data models. I must say the lecture itself is pre-recorded, but Guido is with us right now and here, and he will be taking questions. The questions will be moderated by Tobias Klein, through the Q&A facility that's, uh, that's on the platform. Please submit your questions. We will get to them at the end of the lecture. And if you want, you can also vote on other people's or your own uh, questions, and we can see which ones are the most uh, urgent. And so please do submit questions for the Q&A and let's all enjoy uh, Guido's lecture now. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much for inviting me to give the Sagan lecture here at the Royal Economic Society meetings. Uh, I'm sorry I cannot be there in person. Uh, I would have loved to uh, have been there. I first got exposed to uh, Sagan's uh, work when I was a master's student in, uh, in England in, in Hull. And I've been uh, reading and learning from his work uh, for many years uh, since. So what I want to talk about uh, today is a the recent, uh, sort of fairly recent, very active literature on the causal panel data models. I want to really do two uh, things. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the general literature and kind of how I see the organizing principles, uh, what is new in this literature and um, what people are working on here. And then I want to talk about uh, some specific uh, results uh, uh, from, from my own uh, work. 
And so, um, first of all, I should acknowledge that uh, this is uh, based on joint work with, with Dmitry Arkhangelsky, Susan uh, Athey, Mosin Bayati, Leo, Leah Bodmar, Nick Duchenko, Skip Hirsberg, Kash Kosravi, Lua Li, Xiaoman Luo, Jan Spi, Stefan Wager, Vera Warnick, and Rusan Xian. Uh, there's a number of papers uh, that kind of feature in, uh, in parts of this talk. I'm not, obviously not going to go through all of these papers, uh, but uh, there, there's some common themes in uh, some of this, uh, this work. As a kind of general, uh, I'm going to look at a setting where we have panel data and we're going to be interested in the causal effect of a binary treatment. This doesn't actually necessarily uh, limit itself to binary treatments, uh, but there's a lot of special things uh, there. I'm going to focus on that case because it's also uh, much, uh, much simpler. We go to uh, look at a setting where we observe multiple units. These units can be individuals, uh, often uh, more aggregate uh, units, uh, states, countries, or firms. Uh, we're going to observe these units repeatedly over time. Uh, it could be days, could be weeks, could be years. Uh, and so the, the basic outcome is uh, uh, yit, where i is indexed by uh, well, I runs from 1 to n, and t runs from uh, 1 to t, so it's going to be a balanced uh, panel. And we look at some cases where n may be much bigger than t, and maybe much smaller than t, or they could be uh, similar size. And the treatment uh, may vary both over time and across units. We're going to look at a lot of special structures uh, having to do with the, the treatment. Uh, of course, there's a huge amount of empirical work uh, in this area. I'm not going to list uh, this, uh, but this, in some of the earlier methodological work, uh, people kind of describe uh, the empirical literature in more detail. In particular, the paper, the recent paper by uh, Jenna Curry, Henry Claven, and uh, Esme Sirius kind of describes how the, the methodologies in this literature have become very popular over the last uh, 20 uh, years. And so for in the, the general setup I'm going to consider, uh, we observe and it's kind of separate from covariates, and I'm not really going to talk uh, much about additional covariates uh, here, uh, but in many cases we can bring them in without changing the essence of uh, the type of uh, results we're talking about here. But so in absent uh, these covariates, we have two uh, sets of variables. Uh, we have a matrix of outcomes, uh, this n by t matrix, where the rows of this matrix uh, correspond to the units. And the columns correspond to the time periods, uh, and then we have a matrix of binary uh, treatment assignments uh, uh, denoted by uh, uh, W. For the time being, and sort of for this, this talk, I'm, I'm going to assume there's no dynamic uh, treatment effect. This is kind of, uh, there's an older literature looking at dynamic effect, uh, and there's some recent work, including this paper by Bojanov, uh, Rambakan, and Shepard, uh, where people actually bring in some of these uh, uh, dynamic effects, uh, but here I'm going to focus uh, on the setting where the outcomes only depend on the contemporaneous treatment, not on future or past treatments. Uh, now, that doesn't mean I'm going to restrict the temporal correlation in the outcomes. Uh, we're going to allow for that in great generality, but the treatment effects themselves, the things we're interested in, uh, are instantaneous. Uh, and it means we can think about there being two potential outcomes for each unit time period y0 and y1 corresponding to whether the unit, the unit i in period t is being in the treatment group or in the control group. So what we observe is going to be this uh, matrix of outcomes uh, where the outcome corresponds to the realized uh, value either y0, yit0 if the unit is in the control group in that period or yit1 if the unit is in the treatment group in, um, in that period. And so we can uh, also put this in terms of the potential outcome matrices. Uh, we have these two matrices, y0, y1, where each entry in that uh, matrix is either observed if the unit in that time period is in the corresponding treatment group or not if it's in the other treatment group. So here, for example, unit 1 and period 1 is in the treatment group, so we don't observe y0, but we do observe y1. So for every missing entry here, there's a corresponding observed entry there and the other way around. Uh, and so what we're going to be looking at, what we're going to be interested in uh, the estimate is some, is some average effect. Uh, and so here, um, 
looking at the average effect for the tree that uh, and that has the nice feature that we actually see all the things we need to see from the Y1 matrix and it's just the missing entries in the Y0 matrix uh, that are a problem and so what we're doing either explicitly if some of the methods do this explicitly or uh, implicitly is imputing these missing Y0 values and so for this particular S demand for the average effect for the treated what we need is to impute all these missing values here uh, using these observed values we then we see the the y1s that we need and then we can average the difference uh, over the number of uh, of treated uh, units and so what we're doing you know, is building statistical models making assumptions that will that allow us to fill in these uh, these missing values and then the first thing i want to do is kind of put some structure on that uh, that problem and kind of look at uh, different cases and there's there's two particular organizing principles i want to uh, use here first one is i want to think about the shape of these uh, these matrices uh, and this is something that came up in the earlier panel data literature as well uh, where often people uh, looked at large n asymptotics but sometimes also looked at large n large t or large t asymptotics and so the, the what i want to kind of distinguish here of course where exactly the boundaries of these classifications are isn't clear but i want to keep these things in mind because some of the methods may be great in principle but it may not work for particular configurations of the data so you can think about three general cases one where n is approximately equal to uh, t so where we have an approximately square matrix uh, of outcomes with here i'm just writing down the y zeros where we have some missing entries there that we're trying to impute we could also have the case where n is bigger possibly much bigger than uh, than t and so where the matrix has many rows but few columns i'm referring to that here as the tall case uh, and then the opposite where t is much bigger or at least bigger than uh, n i'm going to refer to that as the fat case where we have the t relatively large but relatively few uh, cross-sectional uh, units and so, so the, this is in some sense kind of the most uh, the trickiest uh, case but we see this fairly often when we use state uh, data we may have observation on 50 states in the us uh, and we may observe outcomes for 40 or 50 uh, periods and i'm going to look at an example of that type later or this could be countries and we may have uh, 30 countries over 20 years or 40 years uh, so these are these are all these all fit into these settings where n and t are roughly the same size at least we can't uh, simply ignore the fact that one of them uh, that not both of them are very very large now that's kind of one organizing principle uh, here and i'm going to kind of keep coming back uh, to that uh, for particular uh, analysis and particular methods there's another way we can uh, organize uh, the problems in this uh, this literature and that's kind of a much more recent uh, thing the earlier literature didn't really pay much attention to the possible patterns in the values of the the covariates or the predictors uh, but so here i want to think about that uh, more systematically because in the general case there could be arbitrary patterns of missing data in the y0 matrix arbitrary patterns of assignment to the treatment uh, so here unit uh, one the first row of that matrix is in the uh, treatment group in periods one and two then in the control group for two periods and later again in the treatment group unit two is in the control group the first two periods then in the treatment group then again in the control group uh, and so there could be a very general pattern there that's actually not all that common M a much bigger part of the literature has very specific structures on the the assignment process again so here i'm giving the y0 matrix but this the question marks correspond to w being equal to one and the check marks correspond to w the particular entry in the w matrix equal to uh, to zero and so much more common uh, pattern and that's one that is explicitly uh, the subject of much of this recent literature is a staggered adoption case where 
uh, units once they get uh, moved from the control group to the treatment group stay in the treatment group uh, forever. An example, sort of early example of that is a paper by um, Susan Athey and uh, Scott Stern where they look at uh, adoption of enhanced 911 uh, technology in counties in Pennsylvania. So the units are counties. Some counties adopt this technology early, some later, some never. But you never see counties initially adopting the technology and then uh, dropping it again. Now, so this, this is a very important uh, special pattern of, uh, of treatment assignment. And there's actually a couple of uh, special cases of that staggered adoption that I'm going to look at in even more detail. One of them is the case where only in the last period units are treated and only some of them. So here, only these units and time periods are treated. Everything else is in the control group. I'm going to refer to it as last period assignment. Another setting is where there's one or possibly a few units treated over a number of periods, but all the other units and time periods are in the control group. Another special, special case of uh, staggered adoption is what I'm referring here to as block assignment, where there's a group of units all switching to the, the treatment group in the same period of time and everybody else in the, the control group. And then kind of the most special case, which is in fact a special case kind of of uh, all of the others, is where there's just a single unit uh, period uh, pair treated, namely one particular unit in the last uh, period and everything else is in the, every other pair is in the, in the control group. And so these uh, patterns are important because they're going to limit our ability to use particular methods uh, and they also suggest looking for particular patterns in the data to do the imputation uh, and so the the recent literature has found it very helpful to kind of to pay explicit attention to the fact that the assignment is the staggered rather than uh, gen general and switches uh, back and uh, back and forth and so next what i want to do is uh, is just look at different parts of the literature that have focused on particular uh, cases and kind of uh, make people aware that in fact these literatures are really closely related and can all be thought of as fitting in this uh, uh, at looking at this type of panel data but in particular uh, uh, settings so the first case is kind of ignorable treatment assignment uh, or unconfounded in this where we look at typically at settings where we have a relatively large number of units relatively few time periods and only in the last period are some of the units uh, assigned to the treatment. So uh, the canonical application is a paper by Lalonde in 1986, where he looks at the, the effect of a job training program. And we have the outcome of interest is, uh, is earnings. We observe earnings for three periods, uh, one post-treatment to pre-treatment, uh, and we observe the outcomes for a large number of treated units and a large number of, uh, of control units. And so in that case, what people often uh, do, kind of what are the, the most common methods is kind of using matching type method. This may be kind of using inverse propensity score weighting. Nowadays, uh, there's a lot of work on double robust methods, but we're somehow adjusting for these lagged outcomes as well as uh, possibly other covariates uh, and then using that to uh, compare treated and control units. And I want to look at a, at a kind of a very parametric way of, uh, of analyzing those data, not one that's kind of in the, among the more fancier the modern methods, uh, but one that's, that's going to make it easier to relate what this literature does to uh, some of the other uh, literatures dealing with this type of panel data. And so this, this very simple, uh, approach is just to do a regression using the control observations estimating a regression of the outcome in this last period where some of the units are treated 
on all the legs uh, and then using that to impute the missing uh, potential outcomes, missing control outcomes for the treated units and averaging that over all the treated units. And kind of what is important here is that when we do that regression, the number of observations in that regression is the number of control units. I'm denoting that by n sub c. And the number of regressors is the number of lagged uh, outcomes t minus 1 plus an intercept. So we have t regressors uh, in total. And so that kind of uh, shows that this is going to work better when n is relatively large. So we have a lot of observations, in particular we need n not to be relatively large. Uh, but we have, then we have a lot of observations. And t needs to be relatively small so we don't have too many uh, regressors. It's not going to work so well if t is very big relative to n, because now we're doing a regression with lots and lots of regressors, but very few observations. And we can still do that, and well, in fact, later we will do that. It's not going to work so well. You would need to use regularization, kind of lasso rich type uh, regularization to make that work. But in principle, what this unconfoundedness type regression is doing is looking for patterns across the time periods that are stable across all the units. And that's the kind of the only thing it's doing. It's kind of treating the, the rows of this matrix as units of observation and assuming that the patterns there, the correlation patterns there, and the same for the control units as they are for the treated units. And that's kind of a key thing to keep in, uh, in mind here. Now, an alternative is uh, synthetic control uh, type methods. Uh, those are often used in settings where we have one or very, very few treated units. Uh, they're treated for a number of uh, periods uh, and often in settings where we have a relatively large number of, uh, of time periods. That's going to become a really big literature since uh, the early work by Alberto Abadi and uh, co-authors in, uh, in, uh, in the early 2000s, so this, uh, Abadi and Gadi Zabal uh, paper, and then later the Abadi Diamond Heimola papers. Uh, and so the, um, I'm writing it here in a slightly different way. Um, you can see that in, in some of the work I did with Duchenko, you can think of these intelligent control estimators as based on a regression where now we don't take the last uh, period outcomes as the outcome in the regression, but we take the outcomes for the treated unit, unit N, in earlier periods, in pretreatment periods as the outcome, we regress it on an intercept and outcomes for the other, for the control units in those same period. So in this case, we treat the, we take these data to run the regression, we take the columns here as the units of observation, and we're regressing the last, the outcome for unit N on the, the outcomes for the other units. And so, kind of, if you do the counting, we now have T pre, number of pre-period uh, observations as the number of observations in that regression, and N is the number of regressors uh, there. So again, this is not going to work so in contrast to the unconfoundedness regression, they really liked the idea of having, where it was really helpful to have n much bigger than t. This is going to work much better if uh, t is much bigger than, uh, than n. And so given these estimates, then we use that to impute the, the missing values for the treated unit. And so what the what the synthetic control approach is relying on is that there's a stable relationship between the treated unit in one of the canonical examples where the Abadi, Diamond and Heimler look at the effect of his anti-smoking program in California. They're looking at the relationship between California and all the other states and they're assuming that that is stable over time. So it looks at a very different pattern in the, in the data. It looks at very different uh, dependency structures than the unconfoundedness regression, even though kind of in principle, the data configurations are not necessarily that uh, dissimilar. So again, um, if in fact 
n is really big, this is unlikely to work well, though you could formally still make it work by doing some regularization uh, using, and uh, the, the way I'm going to illustrate this later, I'm going to use elastic net regularization, but you can use any type of uh, regularization to make, to still get estimates. But if you rely too much on regularization, the, the results are not going to be very good and it just doesn't work very well if t is small relative to, uh, to n. Now, third special case uh, where there's a big literature, it's kind of a more in settings where both n and t are similar size, but there's a block of treated units. And a very popular method there is difference in differences or two-way fixed effect regression, where you essentially estimate the treatment effect by running regression of the outcome using all the data as outcomes, running that regression on a unit fixed effect, a time fixed effect, and the treatment uh, indicator. Now, let me uh, make some general comments kind of on, uh, on this literature kind of, and in particular kind of on the, the modern part of this, this literature. Given sort of this uh, classification, I've given kind of with these shapes of the matrices and uh, the assignment patterns, there's clearly a lot of combinations that ha have received very little attention relative to these three cases where there's a very big literature. And there clearly is much more work to be done kind of in understanding what are effective methods for, uh, for these other cases. Now, another theme that has uh, received a lot of attention recently is that two-way fixed effects, which kind of often was used in this block uh, assignment case, the two-way fixed effect doesn't work particularly well outside of that block assignment case, in particular, if there is heterogeneity in the treatment effects. And a big theme of kind of the modern program evaluation literature is that we typically think that there is a lot of heterogeneity and then we want to account for that and allow for that, uh, that possibility. And I'll come back to the, this particular issue in a minute, uh, but it, there's kind of a big, there's a whole flurry of, of recent papers that look at different aspects of this and make different uh, suggestions. There's also concern kind of by doing inference, uh, in particular in cases where both N and T are not too large. Uh, here are some of the, the papers, uh, but there's much more work to be done uh, there too. And that's obviously a very challenging uh, thing when uh, if one of the N or T is small and the other one is very large, it's kind of very natural to see how you would do inference, uh, what type of asymptotics uh, might work uh, well. But in these cases where both N and T are relatively modest, that's not going to work so well. Fourth uh, thing is that there's good, then in practice, it's likely that there's both correlation patterns over time that are stable across all units, which is kind of what the horizontal regression ex tries to exploit, but also correlation patterns across units that are stable over time, which is what the vertical synthetic control regression uh, tries to exploit. And doing either horizontal or vertical regression, in some sense, it's kind of not, cannot be the right thing because they can only exploit one of these, uh, these correlation patterns. And it's likely that both are present. Now, if T is very small relative to N, there may not be much information in one of these patterns and you may be able to ignore that. But in these cases where N and T are both modest size or similar size, it is likely that both these correlation patterns are there and are important and that they should be taken into account. Fifth uh, thing is that even though two-way fixed effect uh, methods have gone a lot of bad press recently, it is a very attractive model for thinking about, for starting to think about the, the baseline control outcome, uh, especially when N and T are fairly small. It may not be flexible enough when we have enough data when both N and T are bigger, but it, it's a very natural starting point because the unit fixed effects tend to soak up a lot of variation, uh, they explain a lot of the variation in, uh, in outcomes and the same with time effects. Now, first, let me come back to the problems with two-way fixed effect in the general assignment case. So if we have a block assignment case, you can write the, the two-way fixed effect estimator just as a, as a difference in difference estimator. You average the outcomes for the, the post 
uh, treatment periods for the treated units, subtract the average outcomes for the pre-treatment uh, periods for the treated units, and subtract the same difference for the, the controls. And it's all good and well. And in particular, the weights for the outcomes for the treated units are all the same. They're all uh, positive, and the outcomes for the... Uh, and so we're, it's all uh, great. But what has been pointed out in this, this literature, kind of in different uh, verses, if we have, say, staggered adoption or kind of more general assignment patterns, you can write the two-way fixed effect estimator. You can characterize that as a weighted average of the treated outcomes minus a weighted average for the control outcomes. But it turns out that these, these weights for the treated units that those weights are not necessarily non-negative. Uh, they can actually be negative. And that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, because you would think that if the outcome for a treated unit increases, that should be increasing our estimated treatment effect rather than decreasing it. But if that weight is negative, it means that if a treated unit, if the outcome for a treated unit was increased by, by some constant, that would actually lower your estimate of the treatment effect. That doesn't really uh, sit very well. And so people have kind of looked at lots of methods for, for trying to, to address that. And kind of one, one simple thing you can do there is say, well, let's estimate this two-way fixed effect model only using the control units. And once we have the fixed effects there, we can then have impute the y zeros for the treated units and average the difference relative to their treated outcomes. And now it's guaranteed that these weights for the treated units are non-negative uh, and we don't have that uh, some of those, uh, those problems. And we can still exploit the fact that these two-way fixed effects models do actually explain a lot of the variation uh, that is in fact a very reasonable starting uh, working model uh, in these, uh, these settings. Now, for the rest of the talk, I want to kind of uh, give some more specific uh, new results. Uh, I want to uh, actually talk about four themes uh, here. Obviously, counting is not my strong suit. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about using more flexible outcome models than two-way fixed effects. Uh, as, as I said before, that two-way fixed effect may be a very reasonable starting model in settings where uh, T and N are relatively small. But if T and N are bigger, we should do better. We should, and I want to talk about how we can extend these models, what are natural ways of doing that. Second, uh, instead of making that model richer, I want to think about estimating it only locally. Instead of estimating a model, a two-way fixed effect model to predict what's happening in California, using all the other 50 states, I want to estimate a, a fixed effect model but only use states that are somewhat similar to California. And just like kernel weighting, I'm going to use some of the ideas from the synthetic control literature to estimate the two-way fixed effect model locally. And that's going to allow us to build a very tight connection between the synthetic control and difference and differences methods that have often been viewed as quite distinct uh, and where there's sort of a discrete choice to be made. Third, and, and Fourth is quite closely related to that, which is why I originally had three themes uh, here rather than four. I want to look at design-based approaches where uh, we explicitly model the assignment mechanism. In the cross-section program evaluation literature, there's a huge amount of attention paid to the assignment mechanism and to building models for the, the assignment mechanism, which is in that case the propensity score. And so we can do that here. Uh, as well, and that allows us to build more robust uh, methods that in combination with two-way fixed effect models or more general models allow us to, to rely uh, less on the correct specification of the outcome model or on the correct specification of the, the assignment model, but rely on uh, having both of these models provide reasonable working approximations. And last thing, uh, is this kind of a emerging literature on actually doing experimental design type uh, issues uh, and looking at experimental design in these panel data settings. And that um, 
looks like a very promising uh, literature with interesting um, early results. So now for, let me first start kind of with building more flexible models. Uh, and so a very natural way to extend the fixed effect, two-way fixed effect models is to model the control outcome as a the low rank factor model. Now we can sort of if saying that it's a low rank model is, is, is not enough. We need to actually operationalize this. Uh, if we don't impose any restrictions here, we, can, we don't really need the, the, an the error component. Uh, we can always write Y0 as a low rank matrix. But what we're going to do is uh, estimate a model where we shrink things towards a more low rank uh, matrix. And that'll turn out to be very effective in getting a good model that allows us to be that allow, is more general than a fixed effect model, but it still uh, can be estimated well enough. So we rely on the fact that you can do the singular value decomposition, uh, where the eigenvalues of this diagonal matrix are the singular values of uh, the of the lower rank matrix uh, L. We're going to estimate that, and now here there's some subtleties in there. We're going to estimate that using only the control units and we're going to uh, approximate y by three components a unit fixed effect a time fixed effect and this low rank component that is not identified we can fit this just with l because you can absorb uh, the alpha i and beta t in the, into the low rank matrix but the key is that we regularize uh, l by using this uh, nuclear norm that penalizes the sum of the singular values uh, where we choose the penalty term lambda L through cross-validation. So we're pushing things a little bit towards the, a low rank matrix. Uh, we're allowing the fixed effects, the unit and time fixed effects to be unrestricted. And this gives us a very flexible approximation to whatever the Y0 matrix is. A very flexible approximation that has uh, N and T get large will uh, become more and more flexible as opposed to uh, to a fixed effect model where the, the approximation may still be uh, maybe arbitrarily bad when N and T is uh, is large. And so the result of this is um, is a low rank matrix kind of by the rank. So in principle here the rank could be equal to the minimum of N and T, but in practice with the the regularization, you end up with a very small rank, often five or six uh, as the optimal rank given the cross-validation. Now, let me let me show how this uh, works and kind of put uh, what the type of things we're, uh, we're interested in. So here, we took data on the daily stock returns uh, for kind of a large number of uh, stocks uh, for a large number of, uh, of days. And we created a whole bunch of subsamples there uh, of size n times t equal to 4,900, where sometimes we had uh, few stocks, but for a lot of days, sometimes we had a 70 stocks, 70 days, and sometimes we had many stocks, but few days. Uh, so we had uh, these fat matrices, square and tall. And so if you look at this case, kind of where you have very few stocks, uh, say here, only four, in fact, this is smaller than uh, what we use, but so say 10 stocks uh, and a lot of time periods. In that case, it's going to work very well to estimate the relationship between these last two stocks and the earlier stocks, because you have a lot of time periods to estimate that well. This go so you would expect vertical regression, synthetic control regression to do well here. On the other hand, you would expect unconfounded as to not work well because we can't with just uh, um, four stocks uh, and only two in the control group we can't estimate the relationship between the post uh, treatment uh, outcomes and the hundreds of pre-treatment uh, outcomes we're trying to do a regression with very few observations and many many predictors so you would think that horizontal kind of unconfoundedness regression doesn't work very well here the opposite case, if uh, we have a very tall matrix, there synthetic control of vertical regression is not going to work. 
and, and confounding this or horizontal regression is going to work well. You would expect that when the matrix is more square, that the matrix completion that is looking at both will do, uh, will do better. And so what we find is that, as, as expected, when uh, the number of pretreatment periods is much larger than the number of uh, the control units, synthetic control of vertical regression does much better than horizontal regression. But it's the other way around, but, and the number of control units is much bigger than the number of pretreatment periods, horizontal regression that's much better, or in confounders, that's much better than virtual regression or synthetic control regression. But what is interesting is that the matrix completion estimator does pretty much uniformly better than either horizontal or vertical regression, and it adapts very well to the shape of the matrix. So here you can see that where the red line is the average root mean squared error for the matrix completion estimator, the dashed the neon green line is the vertical the synthetic control regression that does very poorly when n is big, but it does quite well when n is small and t is big. And the horizontal regression does really poorly when n is small and t is big, but it does well when um, n is big and t is small. But the matrix completion kind of just adapts and does as well as the best of the other two everywhere. And kind of what's also interesting is to see what the rank is that we end up with. And so that the rank kind of, even though in principle could be as big as, uh, as 50 or 60, is in fact typically quite small, but substantially larger than what we typically see in uh, people using empirical work. So here, can kind of message is that the empirical, the, the matrix completion estimate actually does quite well. Now, let me kind of move on to the local two-way fixed effect estimation. I'm going to make two observations first. One is that the synthetic control estimator can be thought of as doing a least squares regression with time fixed effects and unit weights but no unit fixed effect and no time weights. And kind of when you look at this regression, it's kind of, it is a little funny. When we have panel data, we almost always put in a unit fixed effect because uh, we know that that explains a lot of the variation in the, in the outcomes. Second observation is if you look at two-way fixed effect that, has, that does have the unit fixed effects and has the time fixed effects, but it has uh, no weights. Uh, nah, nah. And you would think that by actually only using units that are somewhat more similar to the treated unit, you may actually do better than, uh, than doing an unweighted regression. When we're trying to predict things for California, it may not help us very much to use uh, Delaware or Arkansas as a comparison. We're going to use states that are somewhat similar to California. And so synthetic difference in differences kind of combines these two ideas and uses the two-way fixed effect specification with the unit fixed effects, but it includes unit weights and it also includes uh, time weights. And so you can think of this as doing a two-way fixed effect model, but estimating it only locally, only using units and time periods that are similar to the target uh, unit and time periods where we're trying to impute things. So here it kind of describes how the time weights are calculated, but it's just exactly the same as the, the unit weights. Now, let me, let me show how that, uh, that works kind of relative to synthetic control difference and differences, as well as relative to the matrix completion estimator. So we took this data from the CPS, uh, the essentially same data that Bertrand Duflo and Melanathan uh, used. Then we're going to simulate data uh, from a model that has this low rank component, has a fixed effect component, uh, has a zero treatment effect, and has normal uh, errors. We're going to choose this low rank matrix of rank two and a fixed effect matrix to, as well as the variance covariance matrix of the errors to fit the CPS data. So the way kind of we did that was first we estimated a rank four model, then we extracted the fixed effects from there 
and uh, use the remainder as the low rank component. So this is still typically a rank four component. Uh, but now we have a very general data generating process and we can kind of switch off these fixed effects and the, the low rank component to see how, how well these estimators do in particular settings. And final part, we kind of create this artificial treatment that depends on the low rank component as well as the, the fixed effects uh, to not have it be completely random. Uh, and we'll see that that is actually important. So here we did a whole bunch of simulations with this. Uh, I'm gonna just highlight a couple of uh, things. One is kind of in the baseline case, if you look at the root mean squared error, the synthetic difference in differences estimator does much better than all the others. It's substantially better than the, the matrix completion estimator, which comes in second. It does a lot better than synthetic control or difference in differences. Where does it come from? It comes from having both the low rank component and the fixed effect. If we take out the fixed effect, then synthetic control does better. No, not by much, but it does better. If we take out the low rank component, the fixed effect estimator does better. Not by much, but it does a bit better. It's also important that the treatment was systematically related to the systematic component in the outcome. When we use a random assignment for the treatment, we see that the synthetic difference in differences still does better, but not nearly as much as it did in the the, in the baseline case. And so in, in the paper, kind of, we have a lot more cases, a lot more uh, details. We try different treatments in, uh, generated in different ways, but the, the systematic finding is that the synthetic difference in differences estimator does very well in terms of uh, the root mean squared error. And it comes from the fact that in many of these data sets, both these fixed effects and the low rank component are actually present. Okay, let me uh, then switch kind of to the, the final part uh, the, of this talk. I talk a little bit about uh, design uh, based methods and trying to uh, bring in some of the design based, the insights from design based methods from the, the cross section program evaluation literature. So, here I'm going to think about a setting where we don't necessarily have staggered adoption, but where we have a substantial amount of variation in the assignment. So unlike the synthetic control setting that is often motivated by a case where there's just a single treated unit, so we can't really estimate assignment probabilities here. I want to think of multiple units being treated so that we can estimate some assignment process. But I want to allow kind of in principle for a lot of uh, non-linearity. So if we kind of think about this uh, as the potential outcomes have this <coughs> unit specific component, time specific component and a, and a noise component, the problem is that both the treatment and the potential outcomes are related, are correlated with this unit specific component alpha i. If you actually observe that we would be done. We could just condition on that, and a condition on that, we would have unconfoundedness, uh, and we could uh, adjust for these differences, and we'd all be done. Now, how does two-way fixed effect? Uh, the, the, how does the two-way fixed effect approach deal with that? Well, it puts a very specific structure on the relationship between uh, the outcomes and the unit fixed effect. It assumes that a relationship is additive. Uh, and so we can just get rid of it. We can remove the dependence of the outcome on alpha without worrying about the treatment, without worrying about what the relationship is between the treatment and this unobserved component. But an alternative would be to try to take account, to try directly work with, to try directly model the relationship between the treatment and the uh, an observed component. And so kind of to uh, start with that kind of note that uh, kind of just by simple method variable bias formulas, you can see that uh, you could get the fixed effect estimates by just running a regression of y on the, the treatment, adjusting for the average treatment for unit i and the average treatment for period t. 
But once you look at this regression, that suggests that we may want to uh, adjust for these variables in more flexible ways rather than just additively. Now, at that point, you're kind of getting away from the two-way fixed effect the approach, and it's useful to kind of think uh, more abstractly about what we're doing in that case. And kind of the general thing, and this is also uh, something that, that has precursors in the work by Altonji and uh, Matskin, we, we can think about there being some statistic, some sufficient statistic S, such that condition on that statistic, the treatment assignment is independent of the, the unit fixed effect alpha i. If, that, if we have such a sufficient statistic, then we would have unconfoundedness condition on S, and we could simply adjust for differences in S to remove biases uh, from comparing treated uh, and control unit time period uh, pairs. And kind of based on the, the early argument, what would be natural is to start by looking at the sufficient statistics that are things like the fraction of treated periods for a unit or the fraction of changes in treatment status uh, and possibly the initial and last period assignment. And so there's some economic models, uh, if some of the structural models that have been used in this literature actually imply that this type of statistic has the sufficient statistic uh, property that it removes the endogeneity of the, of the treatment and that therefore it's sufficient for removing biases and treatment control comparisons. Now, how do we exploit that? Uh, given that we have uh, this uh, sufficient statistic S, we can look for estimators that are linear combinations of the outcomes, and we're going to put restrictions on these gamma, on these weights uh, gamma, such that we're estimating the average causal effect with no negative uh, weights. And if the outcome model is correct, if we have, if the outcome model satisfies a two-way fixed effect specification, that gives us a bunch of restrictions that the gammas would need to satisfy to be consistent under that, uh, that outcome model. If, on the other hand, I give you a sufficient statistic, that implies a different set of restrictions on gamma to make that work. If I give you a particular uh, sufficient statistic, that implies that gamma should satisfy a set of restrictions in order for this estimator to estimate a meaningful average causal effect. And now what we can do, given that if we have not complete faith, but a little bit of faith, both in the outcome model and the assignment model, we could look for weights that justify, that are justified under the two-way fixed effect estimate model and that are justified under the assignment model. And if we use weights that are justified under both, then we end up with a double robust estimator that's going to be more robust to misspecifications of either because it doesn't rely quite as much on the outcome model as the two-way fixed effect estimator and it doesn't rely quite as much on the assignment model as an estimator that only uses those restrictions. And so it's going to give us a way of getting more robustness by uh, thinking about the, the assignment model. Uh, in addition to thinking about the outcome model. Now, there's another way kind of of, uh, of thinking about this. Uh, and so this, this goes back kind of much more directly to the, the program evaluation literature. Suppose we just do a regression of the, the outcomes of the treatment indicator. Uh, even if this model is not correct, if we use a weighted version of that, where we weight by the inverse of the generalized propensity score, then we're still good. We don't have to worry at all about whether the outcome model has unit fixed effects or has other functional forms in there. It's all good once you, you uh, use the proper weights. But that's kind of a somewhat of a knife edge case. If instead of using this simple kind of this so simple model that's not very realistic, that's not very attractive, uh, if you use something more realistic here, if you use a two-way fixed effect model, then these, these generalized propensity, inverse generalized propensity score weights don't work anymore. 
you need to adjust the you need to adjust the weights to take into account the fact that you're using a more complicated model because the two-way fixed effect model kind of uses future outcomes in principle to impute the missing potential outcomes in a way that invalidates the inverse propensity score weighting uh, uh, technology. So what do we do? How, how can we uh, uh, fix that? We want to look at a setting where we have an estimator for or know from the beginning what the generalized propensity score is. And we want to then look for an estimator, look for a set of weights uh, lambda i, such that we get an estimator that is valid if the propensity score model is correct, but also valid if the propensity score model is not correct, but the two-way fixed effect model is correct. And so we want to look at this estimator, but then have weights that are a little bit more complex than the inverse the propensity score weights, uh, but they give us this double robustness. And it turns out what we need to do is we need to adjust these weights a little bit. We need to shift them a little bit uh, with this, uh, with, with this denoted here by this uh, capital pi of the assignment factor. And we can articulate conditions on those weights that tell us, that give us this double robustness. Uh, and it kind of, uh, it comes from the fact it's sort of specific to that, uh, the, that outcome model, the two-way fixed effect model, but you can figure, you can derive uh, what that condition is and you can then get double robust estimators that are like the inverse propensity score double robustness in uh, the standard program, in the cross-section program evaluation literature. Okay, so now let me uh, end kind of by making a couple of comments on, uh, on experimental design. And so here, I'm gonna look at one kind of just very specific uh, question where there's a, a clear answer. Suppose we're actually doing a randomized experiment. Uh, so we, we have a number of units, probably not too many. Uh, but let's kind of think about the, the 50 states. Suppose we pick one at random to be uh, treated uh, and all the other, the other 49 are in the control group. We could then estimate the effect of the, the treatment by comparing the outcome for the treated unit and subtracting the average outcome for the, the 49 control units. That's unbiased for the effect of the treatment for that unit. Uh, and we, we know it has a lot of guarantees coming from the randomization. Uh, the question is whether we whether it would make sense to use synthetic control estimators, which would essentially say, let's look, instead of looking at the average for all the other 49 uh, states, let's just look at a weighted average of, of these 49 states so that these 49 states look more like the treated state. It turns out that has kind of some major advantages, but it has some awkward uh, features. One is, it turns out it does have considerably better mean, root mean squared error properties, but it doesn't come with guarantees. It is in general biased and it's kind of biased because units are not sort of over the randomization distribution. Units are not used equally often as, uh, as controls and that generates some bias. But then it turns out you can, you can remove that bias by modifying the synthetic control estimate a little bit by including additional restrictions on the weights that ensure that each unit will get used equally often as a control unit over the whole randomization distribution. And kind of to, to illustrate the, how that works, here we took uh, the CPS uh, data with 50 states, 40 years, uh, outcome is average log wages uh, by state and year. And we ra randomly kind of pretended each state in turn was being treated. Uh, we estimated the effect for that state, compared it to the actual outcome, as it should be close to zero. And then we looked at uh, when on average, average over all the 50 states, whether we were in fact getting zero and what, what the root mean squared error was 
of that uh, of the various estimators. What you see is that if you use the difference in means, you get a big fat zero for the bias. It is exactly unbiased. The root mean square error here in this case is 0 0.105. If you look at the synthetic control estimator, you do get a bias. It is not, and you can show this directly, you can in fact the, characterize the bias, it is not unbiased. But it does have much better root mean squared error. It has half the root mean squared error. You do much better uh, doing a synthetic control estimator here, using a synthetic control estimator here, than a, a difference in mean estimator. But you do get, give something up. You, you potentially bring in bias, and that bias can actually be uh, substantial. It isn't in this particular case, but it, you can make it essentially as large as you want. And so what you can do is kind of use this modification by restricting the weights, and it turns out that, the, the, you can show that theoretically, it's, it removes all the bias, the bias is now exactly zero, but in fact, it even improves the root mean squared error a little bit, uh, though the, the improvement is very modest. It's essentially the same root mean squared error as the synthetic control estimator, but it does keep, it does maintain the guarantees that came from the, the random assignment. And so it suggests that in cases where we're doing randomized experiments with very few units, we may actually get substantial improvements if we um, use synthetic control type estimators uh, to reduce the root mean square error. And so what it relies on is kind of having these pretreatment years. In this case, we couldn't really, you know, we couldn't stratify on these pretreatment years because there's only a single treated state. So, um, so we're not changing the experiment we're doing, but we're changing the estimator in a way that leads to substantial to, to arguably huge improvements in, uh, in root mean square error. Finally, uh, suppose that uh, this was a case where we actually used complete random assignment to decide which unit got treated. Now, suppose you could also go further and say, well, suppose we actually choose one of the states to be uh, one or maybe two or maybe three states to be in the treatment group and all the other states are in the control group. How should we choose these treated states uh, if we know we're going to be using a synthetic control type estimator? And now it's kind of tricky. It depends a lot on what the target is. If we want to get the average effect for the treated units only, we should choose units that are in the center of the convex hull. You want to use, choose the units to be in the treatment group that are like that are very average. You would choose Kansas because you can approximate Kansas by combination of all the other states. On the other hand, and if you get two states, choose Kansas and the next state over because you want to get states that are very much in the center of the convex uh, hull. On the other hand, if you want to estimate the average effect for all the units, you would like to choose states that span the whole space. So if I could choose four states, and I want uh, Florida and Maine and uh, Washington and California, so we, we span all possible states, we can approximate, we can estimate the effect for all the states in the middle, because it's easy to construct a convex combination of those four states and approximate the, any state in the middle, at least geographically, not necessarily by other characteristics, uh, but if you think of this purely in geographic terms. So it depends a lot uh, on what, what the target uh, is. If you want to just get the average effect for the treated units, you want to choose units in the center of the convex hull. But if you want the average effect for all the units, you want to choose units uh, that are far apart so that they span the convex uh, hull. Finally, if you can actually design an experiment where we can choose which units are treated and also when they are treated, the problem becomes even more complex. Uh, you, would, in principle, want to start with a few units treated and slowly increase the number of treated units uh, in a staggered adoption uh, uh, case. And this type of experiment is actually get, getting some traction in um, some of the, the tech uh, world. So let me uh, stop here.
Uh, what I hope I've, I've illustrated in this, this talk is that there's lots of new developments in the causal panel data literature uh, that has greatly improved our understanding of the two-way fixed effect models. Uh, but it's also opened up lots of new directions for research where we can uh, use design approaches to estimation, inference, and experimental design that gives us opportunities to find more robust estimators uh, but there's still a lot uh, to be done, so I expect this area to continue to uh, be very active for the foreseeable future. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thanks a lot, uh, Guido, for this, uh, this nice presentation. So we move over to the uh, Q&A. Uh, Guido is here, as I said, and uh, Toby, there are some questions. There's still, if you if you hurry up, you can still ask some of your questions in the uh, Q and A uh, facility. But I now give the floor to Toby to uh, to moderate, because he's the moderator. Exactly. Thank you very much. Um, so at this point, we have uh, four questions. Um, I'm going to start with um, the question that uh, received the most likes. Uh, so uh, that question would be, do any of these approaches extend more or less readily to distributional treatment effects um, uh, versus the average or ATT? Um, thanks. Um, yes, I think I think we can we can also uh, a lot of these insights extend fairly directly to looking at uh, objects other than the the average treatment effects. Uh, there's sort of very few functional form specific assumptions in here. The details would have to be worked out, and especially in, uh, exploring the presence of um, of heterogeneity in treatment effects would be very interesting, and not a huge amount of that. Has been uh, has been done yet, so that would be a very fruitful area for uh, future research. Excellent. Um, another question we received um, was: I would be interested to hear Guido's views on the main challenges and opportunities in moving to dynamic treatment effects, which seems a practically important extension. Yes, no, no, I, um, that that's clearly a hugely important uh, area, and so. The tricky thing there is that at the moment, these methods allow for a lot of heterogeneity in the, the treatment effects. And once you also have dynamic uh, components to the treatment effects, you're going to have to sum, somehow limit that because it's, very, it's unlikely that the data are going to be rich enough to allow kind of the very flexible estimation of, of dynamic treatment effects. So the challenge is going to be to build models that capture most of the likely patterns of uh, of dynamic treatment effects, kind of whether these these effects are uh, likely to slowly die out over over time, or whether there's heterogeneity in them by by calendar date. Uh, but it, uh, that's that's again going to be a very interesting area to kind of where the earlier literature kind of some of the, say the the Abraham Heckman chapter kind of has a lot of details on different versions of that, uh, how that would mesh kind of with these more design-based approaches. Mm -hmm. um, the third question would be, I was wondering, what is the key theoretical benefit of using synthetic differences and differences as compared to linear models with factors included directly in the regression equation? By factor, I mean nuclear norm regularized low rank component. Yes, yeah, so, so there the... The insight kind of from the program evaluation literature is that there are substantial benefits to not just modeling the outcome process, kind of the conditional mean of the outcome given the covariates, but also modeling the assignment process. You get the, the double robustness and kind of the, the recent work by Janosikov and co-authors kind of has shown that in practice, you get uh, much better finite sample properties uh, exploiting both models for the outcome as well as models for the assignment mechanism. And so the, the nuclear norm, the kind of matrix completion methods focus solely on modeling the outcomes as a function of these latent factors. 
And the synthetic difference in differences combines building a model for the outcomes with uh, doing things locally, which is essentially corresponding to modeling the assignment mechanism. And so by reducing the weight on units that are very different to the from the treated units, you're going to build in robustness. Uh, and it's, it's likely that in practice, this is going to give you better finite sample properties uh, in cases where the outcome process is difficult to, uh, to model. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, we would uh, leave it at that um, in the interest of time. And uh, with this, I would like to hand back uh, to the chair. Yeah. Thank you, Toby. Thank you, uh, Guido, for uh, a great presentation. So, um, you know, for sure, if anyone has any further questions for Guido, uh, he, uh, he will be happy to, uh, to get, uh, get your responses. I just want to close with, uh, with a few comments about the, uh, about the program. Tomorrow, if you're interested in econometrics, and you may be if you're in this session, um, tomorrow at 12.15 uh, British summertime, there's a uh, informal get together on Zoom that's now on the program. Uh, I'll be uh, chairing it and drinking my coffee in it, but uh, uh, you can chat about whatever you want um, broadly about econometrics. And the Economics Journal also organizes a special session on dynamic discrete choice analysis, uh, which is at 3.30 um, British summertime. And that has presentations by Victor Aguirre-Gabiria and Martin Pesendorfer on various uh, uh, state-of-the-art topics in uh, the analysis of dynamic discrete choice and games. So I hope to see you there. Um, I would also like to point out on uh, request of the organ organizers that you can uh, provide feedback on the sessions and the conferences on the various buttons, feedback buttons on the left and right. And the organizers would really uh, appreciate if you would do so. Uh, and so finally, thanks again to, uh, to Guido for uh, making time for this and uh, having this session. This was great. And, uh, and, uh, and I think it's a great line, line of work. And I think we've all learned a lot. And so uh, thanks a lot. And with that, I would like to uh, close this session. Thank you.